So I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight. His name is Jonathan Fulford. He likes to sail in the northern cooler uh, climates. He is an avid climate activist. Activist. I know I have a friend attending tonight just for that piece. Um, and he came all the way from Belfast, Maine tonight. So welcome, Jonathan. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing you speak. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you to the, the Seven Hill Yacht Club and to the Pelagic Sailing Club. I really appreciate having a chance to talk about and show some of the pictures of these two trips up north. Um, and let me see if I can make sure this is set up. Okay, so if I... Okay. Good. Okay. If I cancel out of this part, minimize this. Okay. Well, so it seems to be showing, but we'll see. Um, okay. So uh, in um, I I some for some reason I love to be up north, and um, just kind of does something really good for me. <laughs> I um, I think that I have needed to do some of these longer trips farther north in the, partly because of the um, commitment I've made to trying to like challenge uh, the systems in our society that are leading us towards a you know climate catastrophe and that's uh, sometimes discouraging it's hard to move um, the course that we're going in um, there's lots of resistance to challenge the status quo and uh, I've done things like run for office and I've done a lot of volunteer work as an advocate, mostly in the state of Maine, um, for trying to change legislation and uh, get better regulations of existing industry and things like that. I kind of hit a wall pretty, uh, pretty often where it's like, okay, I need to do something that makes me remember that I am glad and lucky to be alive, that this is, um, I have a place in this, this beautiful world, and it is something that I'm willing to do anything to make sure uh, we have a good, abundant, thriving future for all life, not just humans. This does it for me. It also restores my, uh, you know, you see some of the best qualities in humans when you're also sailing. So it's also a wonderful part of it. So, um, all right, thank you. so I will just, I have a lot of slides. And I'm gonna kind of burn through them. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. I may not answer your question. If you have it, you can hold it, but you can also kind of speak it up if you want. I'm willing to have it kind of, but if I don't want to answer it right then, I'll just say, let's move on because I got a lot of slides to burn through and I'm happy to take questions at the end. So in, uh, I have a, a BCC 28. So it's 28 foot on deck and it's 37 feet overall. Um, and I often had four people on board which if you know sailboats, that's jammed in there. This is the route that I took. And so I did this in two summers and I left the boat up in Bedeck, which is um, on in the um, Bedore Lake up in Cape Breton in between COVID hit, I couldn't get back to it for two and a half years. And then I continued on. So the orange lines are <clears throat> going all the way up to the very top of Labrador. And then the yellow line is leaving again from Badak and going clockwise around Newfoundland and then back to Belfast, Maine. It's faint, but it is going all the way from Belfast, all the way up the west side of, um, of Newfoundland and all the way up, goes up into, into Goose Bay and in the in kind of the one third of the way up Labrador, and then all the way up to the very top of Labrador, it goes around the Button Islands, goes through the McLean Strait, and comes on back down. So there's the boat, about ready to head out. Um, on this leg, I had a seven foot fatty knees on uh, for the the ding for the dinghy. <laughs> Um, you could only get two adults in it. It made shuttling back and forth in polar bear country a little more intense. It would take about an hour to get everybody offshore sometimes. And by then, at least one or two people have been eaten. So, <laughs> so this is, I run through some of the crew on this first one. 
this was kind of the crew that was in the top part of the trip. Uh, so Ming was my uh, oldest grandson. He was 12 at the time. Uh, Bennett's good friend, I sailed down to Puerto Rico in an engineless boat, 24 foot wooden boat and got beat up off a gate, off of a Hatteras one time with him. Tabitha is a good friend of the families. Uh, my wife at the time, uh, good person. This is another great friend of mine, Abby Morrison. That was everybody that did that trip. Um, so we crossed the Gulf of Maine, you know, the usual kind of lumpy experience. This is it for, and uh, went in, and then uh, we made it up to Lunenburg. We first of all went to Shelburne, went up to Lunenburg, had to do a little bit of repair on one of the sails already. Uh, and this was one of Ming's favorite places to hang out, uh, just uh, taking a rest on the sail. This is going up through, uh, so we work our way. I was just going like fast as I could up the coast of Nova Scotia. I turned out I really liked Nova Scotia a lot more than I was expecting. Anything. Hey, I, I sail on the coast of Maine. What, what's Nova Scotia going to have for me? It was actually really sweet. And I really actually loved the coast of Nova Scotia a great deal. This is going through the lock, entering the lock and um, going to the Bador Lake up in Cape Breton. Um, uh, we saw this uh, the next morning at six in the morning. This was a lobster boat in the Bador Lake that caught on fire. It was a nice sober reminder that when you're on the water, like it's serious. And he was like about a quarter mile behind us off to the side. I watched him at six in the morning, like, oh, this is a nice looking lobster boat. And all of a sudden it was like heading away. I was like, that's an interesting change of course. And then I saw the black smoke and I was like, that's not good. I turned it around, came back. Turns out the captain was okay. The guy was okay. He had made it, he had basically rammed up on shore and then went to get help. Um, uh, not that there's anything to do for the boat, but it was a great reminder of being underwater is serious. So um, <clears throat> we crossed, I'm, I left out large sections just to get through this. So we already went through the deck, headed out um, and crossed the Cabot Strait. This was our, uh, we went up to Puerto Basque, had a crew change in Puerto Basque. Um, and this is Codroy, which is a great, great a little um, hole in the wall that if you're heading up the west coast of, um, of Newfoundland, um, can be really rough. And this is like basically behind Ming, you can see there is a government wharf there. I first of all tied up right where you saw this picture, and then the, the local fisherman said, we, we got a, we, I knew a big storm was coming. He said, You don't want to be there. Move right up in. And I was like, Is it deep enough? Because they couldn't go with the charts. He said, Yeah, it's going to be fine. One thing was when we were in, in uh, Puerto Basque, we went up and visited the Coast Guard station, and um, they were extremely helpful. And they also said, You know, look out for all the sunkers. And a sunker is a dark rock a foot underwater. And he said, there's all kinds of uncharted, this is the Coast Guard, there's all kinds of uncharted sunkers where you're going. And they were right. <laughs> it's a lovely name, but anyway. Um, this is one of the fishing ports. They're the ports are great, when, uh, but they are industrial. Um, if you don't have fender boards with your, if you have tubular fenders, they're not gonna do you no good unless you, you have a fender board or big round fenders. This is Flowers Cove. This is one of the um, uh, more northern ports on the west coast, right before which, and you've already gotten into kind of the mouth of the Straits of Belle Isle. This we just crossed. We had a perfect crossing of the Straits of Belle Isle. Oh, this is not going. Let's see. What is that? Okay. That is fine. Okay, so this is, yes. Now it's caught up. And that's Flowers Cove. And that's typical, uh, typical of the ports along the West Coast. Um, you'll see more of them on the next year when I took more time to work my way around in Newfoundland. All right. Let's see if it catches up. Let's slow. <clears throat> Yeah. So basically we went up, Flowers Cove is near, there we go. So this was, uh, we had a beautiful day for crossing the Straits of Belle Isle. And um, which uh, the Straits of Belle Isle, like Cabot Strait, is famous for being foggy and rough. There's lots of shipping. So this is the northern tip 
of, oh. of where Newfoundland and Labrador and Quebec are all kind of coming together right up there. And Family it gets Harbor. right narrow. Central There's Bay. also the Bell Isle is an island that acts almost like a venturi kind of effect. It like funnels the wind and it really slams in there. And because you have strong current, you get wind against current, you get a lot of fog, you get a rough condition. I have been fortunate on every crossing on the Straits of Bell Isle, and three out of four and crossings of the Cabot Strait went well for me. Um, Going in, I guess. So I was counting. So far, I feel pretty lucky. Um, this was the first abandoned fishing fishing village of many that we came across in um, in Labrador, <laughs> and this is kind of a story of so mismanaged cod fishery. They were going gangbusters, we? and oh. in two years it went from being a thriving small boat day boat fishery that had been you know successfully going for five hundred oh. years of you know European colonization period. Um, to okay. completely collapse. Yeah. And it has not yet recovered very well, a little bit. And so all these villages, all these fishing ports just disappeared, just like that. Um, and you still see the remnants. Now this was, I believe in June, you can still see a lot of snow. They had had- um, Finally they got had, it. They had had a, the driest summer anybody could remember the summer before this. They, have a, they had the heaviest snowfall they'd ever, anybody alive had ever had the winter before this. We were in snowpack all the way up through August. And um, so many, many changes because of climate. Um, and Labrador, like I say, they had the wettest summer that summer and the most fog that I was talking to some of the village elders and they'd say, we've never, no one alive has ever seen anything like this. So. Fast. It takes to jump over. So uh, that there was a small dock in that harbor, in this uh, harbor, but it was uh, about four feet deep off of it, and it was rotten completely away. So like, but it was too. I was hoping it was I could like tie up, but it wasn't going to happen. So, so you can see right through. You can see there's like a hole in the rock right there. You can climb right through it. This is kind of looking from where I anchored back up. It's like lava. Um, much layer there. There was like hawks that were nesting up in there. It was quite great beginning of being in Labrador. I don't know if it's pushed through a little more. So um, this is a little more of that abandoned village. And it pops up. There we go. I believe it was around 1992 is when the cod fishery collapsed. And that's when pretty much everything just dried up. And they had, the Canadian government had just invested a great deal of resources into building outports that had like small fish plants and small houses for the fishermen to like, you know, take their, their small craft from. And just a couple of years beforehand, they dumped resources. No one saw this collapse coming apparently because it happened. So this is like, um, once we hit Straits of Belle Isle, we hit ice and I stopped being comfortable sailing through the night, though the nights were short. So um, I started, so this is kind of like a lot of what we we're looking at. I'm gonna show you a, a, a few icebergs that were some of my favorites of the thousands and thousands. Can we go out? We had to kind of wind our way through this next screen when we see it. We had to kind of wind our way through all those. You can see that one's very rounded. That is, um, those ones had recently flipped. You know, so it was a smooth, that was kind of the underwater side. This next one was huge. That, that kind of crinkly area was probably 30 feet tall. That was a big iceberg. I didn't go too close to them very often. This one was also a real big one. So this, about, this one I just want to go next is about as close as I'd go to them. I could, you know, I tried to stay away. I didn't want them to roll, you know, and something go crunch. Um, uh, growlers are smaller. So there is like, uh, there's icebergs, there's bergy bits, which is a technical term. Like the Coast Guard will, you know, the Canadian Coast Guard will talk about bergy bits. 
And then there's growlers. And growlers are the small chunks of ice that are either falling off or like breaking off underwater and coming up and, um, and kind of surround the icebergs. And most of the growlers are like, probably wouldn't hurt your boat too bad. Bergy bits would definitely do a dump number. Um, the big ones are not what you're worried about. You're worried about the smaller ones that you might not see in rough seas. At least I wasn't very worried that much about them. Um, what was nice about the small ones was it's the best tasting water I've ever had in my life. So we were catching them and uh, melting them down. So. Most of these are coming from Greenland or Baffin Island. And it would take, I was told it would take about a year to two years for them to work their way down through the currents to get down to the Labrador coast. Bell, Stra Straits of Belle Isle. There was ice warnings um, kind of like even farther south along the west coast of Newfoundland. But so I got really nervous earlier on, but I think it was like there was one iceberg somewhere out there that the Coast Guard had seen. Uh, we really, but we started seeing big icebergs, lots of icebergs starting at Straits of Belle Isle. So the Northern tip of Newfoundland and the Southern tip of Labrador. The, and that last one, the blue streaks in the icebergs are just awesome. The hard part was that there'd be like fjords and cliffs and crazy stuff on shore that you wanted to look at. And then there'd be icebergs off to sea and you're like, which way do you look? You know, I usually look at the iceberg. But yeah, those, the, the dark streaks of blue and stuff, I guess maybe, I think it's because it's compressed harder in there, but it's just, uh, it's just awesome. So this is kind of, yes. The air temperature was usually in the 60s, um, a lot of, and sometimes cooler. Um, the water temperature, um, July 29th, when we got to the very top, the water temperature was 33 degrees. It was cold. That's, this is Mary's Harbor. This is kind of the fishing, what from the fishing fleet. Everybody was in because there was a stomp and storm out there. So the entire crabbing fleet, the, the fishing boats work many different, they have quotas for many different species. And so they'll like crab for two weeks and they'll hit their whole quota and then they'll shrimp if there's a shrimp, you know, season is open. And then they'll maybe catch cod very, you know, for a cod season, if they have a cod quota, they might be catching lobster for, like they catch, when they have a lobster license, they usually run in 200 traps and they catch 60,000 pounds in usually a couple of weeks. It's like, and they're catching them in like 15 foot of water is my understanding, 20 foot, very shallow. You know, so the, the lobsters are all moving north. They did not have a, a significant lobster fishery until like just a few years ago. They they fished for lobster. There were some there, but it was never abundant. And now it is off the chart. Right. Right. Generally, it's a little bit Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Well, we were on top of everything. I mean, I have a wood stove on board, and so I ended up burning 900 pounds of wood bricks in the course, which I got resupplied twice as people came up and met. And we did like crew changes, and I'd have like, okay, load your, you know, my Ford Fiesta. You can use my Ford Fiesta, bring it up. You know, the thing I had like way too many miles on it load it down so it's about to break the springs with like bricks of wood and drive all the way up to Goose Bay and then you load that up and so um because you couldn't find wood bricks anywhere up there and they took up much less space so like but provisions were not um uh on this trip going up Labrador coast provisions were a little bit tricky in that um there's not a lot of selection there's not you give up on having great summer vegetables like just you're not having that. You 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 know, on the coast of, of Newfoundland, you're gonna have the best cod you'll ever have in your life. And on the coast of Labrador, you'll be catching Arctic char that's gonna blow your mind. But you're not gonna have a great tomato all summer, you know. So you just have to like trade it off, you know. And uh, but I will say that uh the uh, the butter was top notch. You get cultured butter in Nain, 
you know, because like PEI just is like churns out butter, so to speak. And like, you, so, so, you know, some things were like surprisingly abundant and available, but, you know, veggies, eat your garden vegetables before you go up. Yeah. Um, again, Ming enjoying his favorite relaxation. So we had gone now, this next picture, we'd gone all the way up into Goose Bay. Don't have any pictures of Goose Bay. Uh, we had a crew change, um, uh, the whole adventure in itself, met some of the river keepers that uh, the river keeper, um, Roberta Benefleck, um, Benefield, who is uh, the Grand River River Keeper and has been fighting the huge dams up in Hydro, the Hydro Quebec have been putting in there. If you don't know the history of Labrador and Quebec and Newfoundland, it is a story of extreme uh, exploitation. And these Muskrat Falls, they fought for 30 years as primarily the Innu and uh, I think also maybe one of the Northern Cree tribes. I'm not positive on that. They lost. They built, you know, the Porter coming through Maine is going to be bringing power down from Hydro Quebec, and is a lot of it is on stolen land, just stolen land, and it is massively dumping methane into the atmosphere. It is not a source of green energy, whatever you've been told, it ain't. Because of the methane releasing of these shallow lakes, plus the amount of mercury that is then released into the biosphere, basically the native folks cannot eat their traditional diet without poisoning themselves and their children. This is it is. Um, is criminal. And so up in up in Goose Bay, uh, one of the women that is most involved in this over the last 30 years, um, she let us use her, her old truck to get around town. It's an old base. So it's like, there's nothing's near anything. And while we were trying to get parts and all that, she was super friendly, um, met some wonderful people up there. Um, I think it's the most Northern farm in probably Labrador. And they gave us like potatoes out of their root cellar that were like killer, you know, with, Anyway, they were very, very generous. Everywhere along the trip, people were extremely generous. Okay. When I had mechanical problems, people went out of their way to help me on both trips. People would be like, I can't tell you how many times we were given fish. Like, I, I only turned it down once because we just had caught a bunch of cod and I only have an ice box and I could not eat it in time to do it justice. But people gave us, you know, halibut they just caught. They gave us, like, you know, cod. They gave us, you know, um, salmon, they gave us, you know, Arctic char, you name it. People were just, you know, fish, the fishing community is like incredibly kind and, and, uh, and looks out for you when you're a cruiser up there and you need something, you need help and you're broken down. If you show like, uh, respect and appreciation, people go out of their way to give you a hand. It was incredibly fun. This is an abandoned fishing plant that also, um, uh, this is coming. This is just this is yeah, icy, uh, smoky tickle. I love the name. So a tickle is when it's a passage that's kind of narrow and a rattle is when it's really narrow. So you'll see things called, you know, smoky tickle, icy tickle, you know, cod tickle or something, you know, and if it says rattle, you're like, you're going to be really paying attention. So, and uh, we, you can actually, I'm anchored right there. I'm tied up along. That was a wharf that was barely in good enough shape for me to tie to, but I managed to. While we were there for, you can see there's ice and this is, you know, this is, this was just after Canada Day. So right around July 4th. And this was the beginning of the Northern leg. So this was like that crew you first saw of the kind of salty looking guy in the back and stuff. And so this was when the, the four of us did this major jump, which was from the whole top two thirds of Labrador and back. And that's when um, you start running, there are no provisions in the top third. You just have to have it on board. So, um, about maybe seven weeks, you go all the way up and then back down to right there again. Um, this was collecting mussels. The mussels were small, but they are like packed full and like the sweetest mussels I've ever eaten. You can see how red the hands are getting there. That's ice cold water. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's go. Um, not in this location. Um, this is, was completely abandoned a while ago. Um, let me see. I'm gonna go back to the muscle one. I don't get over it. There we go. That's collecting muscles. Tides are not really big up there. You know, maybe three, four feet, five, maybe at the most. Um, oops, that went fast. All right. So that is. That is the ice net 
that we built out of um, uh, out of scrap that we found there at, at uh, Smoky Pickle. And we went backwards, sorry about that. And so we didn't have what we were realizing. We saw all these bergy bits and, and we needed, or in all this like growlers and we wanted to get a way to get them on boat. So we built that ice net. That was uh, Ming's project with Bennett and we started catching ice. And again, it's like ancient ice from the, you know, from the Greenland and from Baffin Island uh, glaciers. And it is extremely sweet. Yeah, that mm. um, it, like the salt would just melt off. The salt water would melt off in a couple minutes. You'd just have it on deck and it'd just be like crackling a little bit. And then it'd just be perfect. And uh, we kept the, the ice chest, you know, cold with it. Though the water was so cold, it didn't get, you know, ice lasted a long time, but mostly we were drinking it cooking with it. Um, and you can, yeah, it's just a, cult, a wild contraption in order to make it work. It took two people and, you know, it was, it was fun. So that is actually way up at the very top, but you know, the biggest chunk we were able to get in the net. Um, but the other thing amazing about, uh, about Labrador, which I did not believe when I first heard it, until we, but <clears throat> you can drink the water out of any of the streams and ponds. There is no giardia. There is no parasites. You can just drink it straight up. And we did. So we weren't catching ice. We were drinking straight. You just like lie down, put your face in the water and drink. And it was good water. Which was a real treat. You know, having to be so careful around water everywhere down here. Um, uh, when we were in Goose Bay, which is 200 miles inland, you know, there's this long brackish lake that, you know, you know, salt, and then it goes to brackish. It was some of the worst mosquitoes I've ever seen in my life. And, um, and I've been in Alaska and been in Northern Quebec a fair bit over the time, but they were ferocious. Um, but um, uh, other than when I was up in the interior, because we were out on the outer islands, the bugs were almost non-existent. It was great. There's a polar bear, you can see. We saw polar bears a, a number of times. We did not go ashore. We saw a polar bear. If when we saw one in the water, we did not go up next to it. They can jump right up on an iceberg, you know, they jump right up on a boat. I had my grandson with me. I was not about to have to tell his mother I fed him to a polar bear. So, and they didn't really have one anything to do with us. When we did the, um, the training uh, at, which I'll show you a little bit farther up. Uh, they did say, if you see a skinny polar bear, like do anything you can to stay alive because they will eat you. Most of them were, you know, very well fed. They just were jiggling with fat and didn't want any trouble. And they just, they got, they left. Um, yes. So this is a polar bear skull. We found it at the very top. You can see it's pretty fresh with the pink on the side there. It was killed by another polar bear. What you can't see very easily is right at the very top of his skull is a big puncture wound and another polar bear bit it into its brain. And a male polar bears are territorial and will fight. The only thing that really can kill them is another polar bear. Um, we, uh, that was big, like that, that skull was about that big. That was a, that was a big skull. Um, uh, so firearms, um, I took a uh, Benelli 12 gauge pump. Uh, shotgun and um, uh, I don't know if you could actually bring it into Canada now. They've changed the laws in recent years. Uh, at the time, the only way I was allowed to bring it across customs was because I said there's one question I had to answer correctly, and they asked, they asked me at least four times. And when they boarded the boat and inspected, like, so why did you bring this gun into Canada? Large predator protection. As the only reason I was allowed to have that shotgun in Canada. So, and um, they also was re requested that, that if I saw a polar bear and had the shotgun, first of all, you fire a blank right out immediately. And if that doesn't work, then you shoot to kill because they're about to eat you. You know, and they, will, they can cover ground like so fast. We saw them at one, at one point, we um, watched a polar bear. We came into this one schooner cove, I think it was pretty far up. And we came in and it was on this spit and there was like a cloud bank at about a thousand feet up. And there was like a snow field going straight up into this cloud bank. And we come in and it's like running across boulders about the size of these chairs, like just like 
but like I'd be stumbling or it was just trotting across these like three, four foot boulders, like boom, 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 hits this snow field. It's like almost vertical and it doesn't even slow down. It's like, and just disappears a thousand feet up into the cloud line. I mean, those things are, they can move. So this is Hopedale. This is the second, I think second high, uh, farthest North village or one of the farthest North. We've got clearance there to go into uh, in new territories there. Uh, you'll hide. Nain. Nain is the farthest north village. All the villages farther north were relocated by the Canadian government years ago. Uh, when we were in Nain, um, we'd be talking, we were there, we were waiting for a part. It had broken, you know, and I was trying to get a part. I eventually left without it. That was something. Uh, the whole trip, like, the boat was like, barely doing it like, you know parts breaking on the engine I mean, you just had to keep going anyway you know, just like you, know, you make it good enough and there you go but again super generous this guy um name was last name was webb and uh he uh the, he, uh we needed fuel um fuel super expensive and this is the last chance to get fuel and um uh the fuel the fuel the one uh, fuel company was closed. The guy was out fishing for the weekend, and this guy said, "Well, let me talk to my brother-in-law." And they kind of, "We got this barrel. We'll, we'll sell it to you." And so they brought it on down to the dock and pumped it in, and tanked up, which was critical for doing because then that that next leg was 700 miles up and back. So, and in the higher latitudes, you have gales and calms. Gales and calms. Gales. And calms. Gales and calms. Not getting 15 knots of like sailing weather. Pretty much ever. Um, and so, and you also got a pretty good stiff current coming down the coast there right on your nose as you're going your way, no, going north along the coast. Um, on the coast of Maine, I don't think I've sailed more, maybe never have I sailed with a triple reef Maine and staysail only. And that was often my working sail plan. I was sailing in 25 knots a lot. So um, you just get comfortable with it, but. But it was also motor sailing a lot because you're, you know, to make 70 miles average a day, you know, I had to be the wind on the nose. I'm pinching it right tight and just pushing hard. Even if you're, and we'd be sailing, we'd be getting up. Um, we try to get up around sunrise. You know, there were about four hours of dark, semi dark, and we'd usually be trying to get up before six, five, so morning sometimes. We had a race on this leg where we'd decide before we went to bed, like, Who's going to be the two people on deck and who's going to be down below? The people down below, their job would be to make the fire, start making hot water, make hot drinks, make hot breakfast. And the ones on deck would be racing to see how fast they could get anchor up, electronics on, you know, sails set, motor going, and gone. And we could do it in about 15 minutes, you know, by the time we're done. And it was always a fun race. So this is the way they dry the Arctic char, the guy there in Nain. This was a local fisherman, Joey. He's famous uh, everywhere in all of uh, Labrador and Northern Newfoundland. You mentioned Joey uh, in Gornock. They're like, oh yeah, we know Joey. Uh, and he lives there in Nain. He has a native a fishing crew. This is the, the only large fishing boat that far North. Um, he just helped us out a ton. And he had his tie up alongside him when there was no place else to tie up. And the guy is, uh, there's a lot of good stories about Joey. This was leaving Nain um, through Webb Bay. There's like an inside passage to get you back out to the coast. Uh, this is early morning catching. You have to catch the tide. Yes, right. A little bit later that morning. This was the last sunny day. We hadn't had many. And we thought, okay, we're heading into northern Labrador. Beautiful sunny day. Excellent. And that was the last of it. And when we came back to Nain, two and a half weeks later, there was a part that was supposed to arrive for my boat. It was the raw, um, it was the uh, raw water pump. And so I was spraying salt water all over my engine, the entire friggin' miles all the way up and back. And my mechanic back in Maine said, you'll have some problems, but the engine will keep running. Just go for it. And I was like, okay. And uh, I, I have had some problems since then with that much salt water. All over. I'd be pouring boiling fresh water all over my engine and wiring every night just to get the salt off it. But <clears throat> we got there and we got back and uh, you know, wouldn't have seen this without it. Um, 
Yanmar 3 GM 30 F. Yep, great engine. Um, and uh, so those, these are like, this is, often these are like 3000 foot high or so cliffs and hills and stuff. These are, it's big, lots of waterfalls. Lots of water, this is going up in uh, North Arm of Saglick Fjord. This is, um, this actually, you couldn't go ashore here. This is actually a, a native burial ground right there and white people are not allowed to go ashore. So it's just for, and um, this is where, um, yeah, it's just a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Beautiful, beautiful place. And uh, this is part of also that fjord. That is Bishop's Mitre. Yes, sir. Baxter State Park expanded to include the land around upper and lower Toe Ponds in the 1990s. But the Clark family remains firm. I've taught about it and I actually bought all the paper charts for it and laid them out in my son's shop one time for my birthday party two years ago. And so you could walk the entire Northwest Passage. That was fun. But I kind of, the more I research, you know, I think that I want to do Bath and Island. That's where I want to go. That's my next. Um, uh, 5,000 foot high shear cliffs coming out of 2,000 foot water with glaciers calving at the top. I mean, that sounds pretty cool. So, so Bishop's Mitre is about 3,000 feet tall. I think it kind of looks like the Troll King's throne, you know? That is, is it just around the corner? Uh, and okay, so, so I guess we had two sunny days. Actually, three. I can think of another one that happened later. I mostly took pictures on a sunny day, so you don't see all the fog and rain. So there's um, this was anchored in um, right below that there's mountains, and um, there's a minky whale, and it was fishing between us and the shore for Arctic char. I had yet to learn how to catch Arctic char at this point. Turns out Arctic char you have to catch like on the shore. Like they are not out 100 yards from shore. They are like. 50 feet out. So if you anchor and you're casting, you know, think I'm near shore, I'm never going to catch an Arctic car. But if you take your dinghy right up on the rocks, or if you're on the shore itself and you're casting, that's how you catch an Arctic char. And so it was catching Arctic char between us and the shore. One of the neat things about the Saglik Fjord is that the rocks, some of the rocks in these cliffs are 3 billion years old, which is 500 million years older than water was liquid on the surface of the planet. Right? Earth's what, 4 billion years? So three quarters of the age of the Earth. You know, 2 billion, you know, like, was it 2 billion years ago, single cell organisms, Earth now these, these rocks, I mean, it was humbling. Hello. And in some way, like often when I'm on the ocean, I'm deeply kind of, um, puts the trials and tribulations of our lives a little bit more in perspective when it's like, these rocks don't give a damn, right? <laughs> they, yeah. They've seen everything and then some. And so, yes, it matters what we do in our lives, but at the same time, it puts it in a little different perspective. Um, I find that helpful. So we were having a great day, you can tell. This is farther up in Saglik. I'm showing you only a few of the waterfalls and only a few of the icebergs. We saw thousands of waterfalls. Any one of them would have been like a famous named waterfall anywhere in the United States. And they're just another unnamed massive waterfall falling 1,500 feet into 1,000 foot deep water or whatever. I'm just like this everywhere. Big, like these are big waterfalls. So this is the Torn Gap Mountain National um, Park at the base camp is just outside of the park. It's 100% staffed by native. Um, uh, it's a it's a cooperatively run by the national and the and the tribes, um, national the uh, national government in Canada. And there's bear guards that you can hire if you want. We didn't take them. Um, once you leave there, you're into the Torngat National Park. You cannot take a shotgun or any firearm ashore. Uh, it turns out bears can be discouraged, probably, with flare guns and flares. And if you remember a number of years ago, there was a uh, man from Lewiston, Maine, that was on a Sierra Club trip up into this 
just into this park and he got partially eaten by a polar bear their first night out and they drove them away with flares. He drove away the bear, got him to drop him. He was a lawyer from Lewiston. So, um, so if you're up around polar bear country, we always carried a lot of flares <laughs> with us. Everybody had flares and a flare gun, you know, both flare guns. The, those round things, those are like some of the experimental like lodging they tried out. Most of them were, in, mostly they had yurts. And they had a high tensile, like six foot high electrified fence that they fired up all night long. They would have, they had bear guard patrolling the perimeter. They were actually more concerned about black bears than, <laughs> than, than polar bears right there. Yeah. The polar bears also came yeah. around. They'd seen Maybe. them the night before we got there. Um, the black bears are super aggressive in Newfoundland. I mean, in Labrador. It's the only population of black bears that coexist with polar bears. <laughs> And so they're just like, they're fierce. They're not like black bears down here, which, you know, they're not gonna really mess with you unless something significant happens. They're like fearless, they're big and they're aggressive. So um, kind of like black bears in Alaska are kind of like, they're not like, you know, Eastern uh, black bears. And um, the, apparently what the bear biologist said, uh, if I recall, he said, the reason why the black bears are able to coexist with polar bears is they can outrun them. But right, there's no trees. Like we're above tree line. They just have to be able to outrun a polar bear because otherwise a polar bear would eat them too. Because everything's food to a polar bear. The um they, they you do a training for they they you can do a training, they request they request that you do a training, they request that you come in there. Um they fed they were they treated us like royalty. They like they had a, a whole chef and a kitchen, you know, you're way out there and they, like fed us Arctic char, they got cooked up and it was, they, you know, it had a, a good salad. Like I couldn't tell you how long I've been since I'd had a salad. So that was pretty nice. Um, and then they show you this polar bear training about how to stay safe. The polar bear looks relaxed, focused on you, ears forward, just looks happy and is coming straight at you. It's gonna eat you. <laughs> That's a bad, a happy looking polar bear, bad sign. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So. This is like another mountain with this. You can see the whole like, um, like this is thousands of feet high. You can see that kind of like scratch there is like an avalanche chute. This is, you can see the boat from the harbor there. I think this, not schooner, I don't think that's schooner, but I cannot remember which one. This is kind of getting pretty far up. You can see the, the hills get lower after you get past the fjords in the middle. There's still fjords, but the, the elevation starts dropping the top like twenty percent of Labrador. Oh, this is back in Saglak. This is the this is the cliff that I assume I have no reason to know, but it is three billion years old. It was just so spectacular. You can see the iron rust. That was about three thousand feet high, if I recall. And you know, huge talus slope there. This is actually the northern tip of Labrador. This is um, Cape Chidley, and um, and it was just like being Penobscot Bay. You know, Fog. You couldn't see a thing other than you had um, going around what my favorite bird on this trip was the northern, northern fulmar. And they were very friendly and they would just kind of circle the boat. They'd come like one of them would kind of circle the boat 28 times. They come like right one time we saw them go between the um, the uh, jib stay and the staysail stay. But they usually come right next to the bowsprit and then right back. So to go out like 100 yards. You know, kind of sweep around. They come right back by, just kind of looking at you. They were like, I thought they kind of looked to me like kind of like cuddly flying bunny rabbits. But nobody else on the trip thought they looked like that. But they were very, very friendly. And we saw, and they nest up there. We saw thousands of them, and they were by far my favorite bird. It turned out for this trip. You know how you're allowed to like, you know, sailors say like every five thousand miles you can get bird tattoos. Supposed to be a swallow. I kind of figure if I maybe I do a, every five thousand miles a bird tattoo of one of each, noting each trip I've done that adds up to that. I would probably that would be my first choice. You had a question? This is coming into the Button Islands. We crossed the strait there. This is like the outflow. This is the 29th of July. The um, basically Ungave Bay and Hudson Bay are roaring out past the tip, northern tip of Labrador. There's a 30 foot tide on one side and a five foot tide on the other. 
we were off the depth sounder. We were over 2,000 foot deep water and we were having upwelling, like massive upwelling. So like this and the birds were everywhere. And I was, I think it was about a four and a half knot current. I was crabbing my way, engine flat out, sails pulling until I got here. And then we just made it to the entrance. And this is where Annie Hill was up here with her second husband. Um, and so we had read about that. And I had another good friends who I had kind of been inspired by, uh, Mick and B, um, who had to have this like, you know, like 40 something uh, ferro cement catch. And they spent like 15 years cruising up in these areas. And they, they, a lot of their stories are what inspired me on this trip. And so they'd been up here too. And um, it's, uh, it's a tiny little hole in the wall. And that's what it looks like on the Button Islands. And um, this is where we found that polar bear shell. So my friend Bennett, we actually went swimming in that water because we stunk at that point. And um, if they'd been fishing it, they probably would have died. But that water was cold. Um, and essentially, you could, we were looking, we could, you know, this was like another that clear day. It's like, oh my God. And Bennett was like, I was like, we got to keep on going. You know, we've got to make it around the, around the point and stuff. And he's like, we made it to the top. It was a beautiful, clear day. Like, let's go hiking. It's like, all right, you're right. You got to enjoy it. You know? And it was beautiful. And like, you can look to Far Horizon and just, it seems like it must be just out of sight is Resolution Island. And then beyond that, Baffin. So you're looking north towards Baffin from there. And it's just scoured, as you can see. This was looking down into this, this line of freshwater lakes, like this, this, like a finger ripped right down through there, glacier did. And a, a red throated loon was like this. We're, I'm looking down about 150, 200 feet down to the water, and there's a red throated loon just calling away, calling away down on that lake right there. I was hoping to be fishing there, but I, we didn't catch any. So Ming was like, had brought on shore like a um, garbage bag, and it's like in order to go sledding. So we were sledding on the 29th of, of July. <laughs> and then we were a little tired. We were outside of the Torngat National Park. So um, so there's like Bennett, me, and Ming we took a nap on the grass on the on the moss. And Tabitha had the shotgun keeping guard. So we had just found that skull. Fishing for our big char. We didn't catch any there. There was a lot of seal in there. I think they had eaten them all. You can see the boat off in the distance. I was anchored in 90 feet of water. I had 300, all 300 feet of my chain out. And um, if I went 350 feet, I would be in 15 feet of water or less. Like it just was like, <laughs> so uh, it was the only spot I could find to anchor in there. But this is where Annie Hill had anchored in a number of other kind of like kind of awesome Arctic kind of subarctic sailors. Excuse me. All chain. Yeah, I have uh, um, uh, five sixteenths high tensile, uh, and I have three hundred and four feet, and then I have like twenty feet of nylon at the end just to be able to cut it free and hopefully tie a buoy on it that I could get back later if I ever had to throw it overboard. That's my, that's, and I have a Rockna, uh, Rockna, twenty kilogram, which is way oversized for my boat, but it's like I don't want to mess around. And once I went to that anchor. I had a CQR before that and a Bruce and like it is night and day. So I trust, I trust that. Yes. Excellent, very good. Uh, so the question is, did I pass anybody at all on the Labrador coast? And I think we saw a total of not counting fishing or hunting boats. This is a hunting boat here, hunting and whaling boat. Um, we passed probably five boats, six, six sailboats, maybe all told in the course of the summer up there or the two months we were on that coast. Um, and they were all either going to Greenland or coming back from Greenland. Um, and most of them were in the southern 20%. I think we passed one, uh, one that was in north, the northern half, north of Maine, and um, and they had just come flying back. They were on this big sailboat, and they were like blasted by us, and they had, they had just made landfall coming from Greenland. Turns out, because I ran into them in twenty twenty two, 
in um, one of the crew in Lewisport in northern Nova Scotia, in North, northern Newfoundland. This was a native hunting and fishing and whaling boat that can come up from the Quebec side. And we were, had made it around the top of, of um, Labrador. And there is this crazy strait called McLean Strait that is like 18 miles long. And when I looked, was looking at the charts, when I was thinking about this trip over the years, I was like, I got to check that out. I like get just begging to go through. And when you read about it, it's like sketchy. And like, because of that tidal difference, there's not great tidal information exactly when the tides are going to be. Um, you get 15 knots in greater current. Uh, we were told that like from by one of the native guys, like by Joey actually, that he said that he, um, he said that he had heard of like large icebergs being sucked under with the whirlpools. Um, like you just, it's ferocious. So you just, so the trick is, is you kind of like you do your best guess of when the tide's going to turn. You set yourself up right at the mouth of it, which we were right here on the west coast, and you start motoring or motor sailing up against the outgoing tide as it's starting to and it's just even when the current is slow it's even wild like upwellings and it's just disturbed water and then you just go as hard and fast as you can through as fast as you can and it turns around on you and just get shot out the other end like a cork it's like boom you're doing like you know 12 knots across the bottom you know 15 knots about across the bottom you're just like boom. the last the last couple of miles you're just flying these folks came up, they saw us, they like came up to us. I thought they were like Mounties or something. They were flying up. They got twin 70s on the back, two boats, four generations, like a the great grandmother, um, her son, it looks like his partner, and a grandchild. Um, wasn't sure quite what the different relationships were, but they were all part of the same extended family anyway. And they came up because they were deeply concerned, like, what the hell was I doing up there? And was I safe? Did I know what I was doing? Did I have charged? They were very concerned for my welfare, uh, which was very sweet. And finally they figured, they finally figured, okay, well, they must be know what they're doing. And they were like wondering, so when did you start? And I said, well, May, uh, end of May. And they said, how did you leave? There's so much ice. Like they didn't have any idea that, you know, like they, there's never any ice out in, in the end of May up there. So, um, and I said, oh, that was a lot farther south. And um, and they they came up and they kind of said, so uh, you seen any, any caribou? And uh, I said, well, we saw some uh, about a week ago in Eclipse Harbor, and so that's too far. Um, and then they said, well, um, we're looking for caribou. Um, see any whales? I said, well, we've seen a bunch of minkies lately. And said, oh, they don't taste good. Oh. Seen any beluga? And I was like, haven't seen any beluga, not, not for a long while anyway. But they were, they were, uh, they were out hunting and, and uh, looking for food. And uh, after they checked out and made sure we were safe, they're like took off, and the entire inside of the cockpit's like full of jerry can, solid gas, solid gas. And they were about seventy miles, I think, from their the village that they'd come up from. The question was, did I try any whale meat? No, I didn't have. I never had any offered. So, um, what's that? I was at, uh, did I have any bear? I did not, was not offered any bear either. So we saw, like I say, a lot of black bear and a lot of polar bear, but no one's saying here's some. The, the polar bears are not hunted. They are, um, they are only killed when in, a, in defense and that's as rare as possible. They really respect the polar bear and they don't want to mess with I can't remember the name of it. It was on the um, east, uh, so if you go down into Ngave Bay, it sounded like they were like most of the way down on Ngave Bay. Um, so, and I think they were the farthest north village. It sounded like they, I, I found that at one point on the charts, but I cannot remember. Was there another question? That was question. What village did they come from? Yeah, so the thing is about how tigers in some parts of the world can swim out to sh and like go after fishing boats, and that in um, in Canada, um, you know, it's pointed out that uh, humans are not the top predator, and that is true. Polar bears are. We are just another tasty kind of another type of meat, another flavor of meat. Um, the um, 
they don't really want to go after us, but they're not afraid of nothing. One of the bear guides or one of the bear, um, one of the rangers at the base station said that um, they do a lot with just like those small helicopters. It's like, you know, the ones they're so dangerous, you know, this little gas, like, you know, little ones carrying two people. So they get a lot, they get around a lot with that. He said, <clears throat> but they're loud, right? He said one time he was coming up with a pilot up a ridge and they come up to the top of the ridge and when they crest the ridge and they're right above the ground, there's a big full grown male polar bear was right on the top of the ridge and it did, was not intimidated. It just stood up and just was like, you know, you want a piece of me? Come and get it, you know, like totally unintimidated by a helicopter right on top of them. You know, it's like a full grown healthy male polar bear is not afraid of nothing. So, um, we took that <laughs> advice, you know, that information. Whenever we saw bears or tracks of bears on the ground on, on land, we got out of there as fast as we could. This is entering into that um, McLean Strait. Oh, this is this is like a little bit of reality. So this is boat. This is twenty eight foot boat uh, uh, down below, like halfway through a trip of uh, in northern Labrador. It you know you got my wood stove there. Like it is. We were on top of each other, on top of our gear. It was raining and wet almost every day. So we had foul weather gear hanging everywhere all the time. It was uh, not for the faint of, uh, when, uh, well, if you had a sensitive sense of smell, this would not have been good. Um, privacy was you looked the other way. Um, it was, uh, and you know, people respected that, which was good. I'm on, that's like just a sunset up in Northern Labrador. We worked our way all the way. And so this is like Bennett fishing. And that was a really pretty shot. I don't know if he caught a single fish the entire trip. He was the worst fisherman on a trip. The rest of us caught a lot of Arctic char, but Bennett just didn't have, there's, there's, that was given to me actually by a, a fisherman, native fisherman, they gill netted that. That was the biggest Arctic char we got. It was still alive when they handed it to me. Um, there's one Ming caught, his arm was getting tired. He's like, come on, grandpa, take the picture. They taste so good. There's cooking them on the wood stove. Bennett said, you got to take a picture. Like, you know, you, people, people you do almost anything for that. You know, fresh Arctic char with butter and fried in butter with lemon with like, like on the coast of Northern Labrador. Like that doesn't get any better. What's that? Yeah, and then a few um, just there. I, I just we had lots of pictures of flowers. Bennett was particularly good at taking them. I'll just show a few, like just the high Arctic, or it actually wasn't high Arctic. The the in the tundra and above tree line, just the flowers are just amazing, um, and uh, so varied. Pops up. I think that first one may have been like fireweed, but it was this tall. You know, fireweed's normally like this high. Yeah. Mm. Yes, we were eating um, blueberries. Like the blueberry, the blueberry, a low bush blueberry would be like, there'd be this little blueberry with like two leaves and a berry. Like the berry was almost as big as all the, you know, it was just amazing. And um, it's an Arctic poppy. But lots and lots of beautiful, beautiful flowers, all very small, all like intense color. This is on our way down. This is heart right, I think. Um, one thing I will point out, though, hopefully I will get in trouble if I go back up there if anybody's watching from Canada. Um, you'll notice that my flag etiquette isn't quite correct. The Labrador flag is above the Canadian flag, which the fishermen appreciated that, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> like you don't see too many Canadian flags on it. People are flying the provincial flag. So, so that's a that boomkin sticking out is where then I have a double backstay. I don't have a running backstay, but I have a double backstay running up, and it just gives the room for you know the the backstays. And then my um, my boom, uh, basically on the boom crotch, it swings you know very free and clear underneath my backstays. So it extends the rib, the the rig. I also the question was why don't what's that thing sticking out the back and why is my 
boom can sticking out so far out of the back of the boat. I also have a wind vane on there. Um, and the bowsprit on a BCC 28 is seven feet long. So I have I'm 20, 29 feet of extended between two feet in the back on the boom kin, seven feet on the bow. I'm 28 feet on deck. I'm 37 overall. I carry a lot of canvas. So in light air, I can move, even though it's a heavy displacement boat, seven ton boat, 28 foot on deck. It's, it's a, it's a, but she moves beautifully. Um, I had a tiller pilot that uh, failed completely on me on this. Um, it was, I figured out that it was actually after troubleshooting it a ton with or on tech support on the way up, I just installed it. I'd always just hand seared or wind vane. If I was motor sailing so much, that wasn't going to work. And the tiller pilot didn't work because the way it was, it was getting too much interference from my batteries right below it. So it never, we would never hold a course. So we hand steered 4,000 nautical miles. Great having four people on deck. Um, thank goodness, most of them really love the sail. Um, so uh, this was, I'm jumping over a lot of territory right here. We came on down and this is the best hurricane hole I've ever seen in my life. And, and we got hit by a hurricane. This is, um, uh, this is Surprise Cove in big uh, Gig Harbor in the Bador Lake. Just as you come in the entrance, coming down the north, if ever you're up there and you're wanting, and you're going to need to like save yourself. 80 foot high gypsum cliffs on three sides. We tied off to the trees at the base. Um, that hurricane that hit in 2019 uh, leveled Nova Scotia. It was a week, three quarters of the province was out of power for over a week. Um, just around the corner, just six miles away is Padek, and six boats dragged their moorings and were lost totally. Um, there was just across, just, just across Cabot Strait. Other side of Cabot Strait, in the middle of that storm at two o'clock in the morning, there was a measured 100 foot high wave with an average sea height of 50 feet. <clears throat> yeah, you're dead, right? There's nothing that could take that. So that was just outside of uh, Port of Basque. And, um, and they calibrate, they checked to make sure that the buoy was calibrated correctly. It was. So, and we were tied up underneath those trees and we had some leaves land on the deck. And even when the wind backed around straight at us, we were in the wind shadow below the below the cliffs, never had anything happen. And we were actually catching mackerel um, that, you know, in the middle of the night and cooking them up and eating them. It was just, it was pretty nice. So that was the first trip. What's that? How much warning to have on a hurricane? Several days, it was off of, um, off of, Florida, when one of my brothers who sailed a lot and lived aboard for seven years on a 42 foot cat, um, uh, he was one of my ground support. And he called me up and said, that hurricane is accelerating up the East Coast and it's got a bullseye on Nova Scotia. And I was already like almost all the way out of um, the Bador Lake. And I looked at the charts and I could not see any for sure hurricane holes on the coast of Nova Scotia once I left Bador Lake. So I found what I thought was a good hurricane hole. And um, by then the hurricane was still like barreling right at it. And those good friends of mine, Mick and B, who um, have the sailing boat, Hannah, they had been following me on AIS and I had a Garmin in reach. Um, and they, I hadn't talked to them all summer. They texted me and say, Jonathan, are you sure you're in the best hurricane hole? And like, they never give advice. I'm like, uh, well, it's not ideal. I'm in about 10 foot of water, but it's a lot of fetch and it's soft mud and there's no high hills around it. But it's the best I could come up with looking at the charts. And they said, well, we know a bomb proof hurricane hole. And they, they never exaggerate or say, it's like, if they're saying a bomb proof hurricane hole, it's like, it's, you're going to sail a day back, all the way back up again through the Bador Lake to get to it. Um, and by now, the hurricane's like two and a half days out, two days out. <laughs> When I look at the charts and it's like microscopic, I'm figuring like probably it's all going to be full of boats. Then what are I going to do? But I figured, okay, I'll take their advice, pull the anchor, head it up there as fast as we can. We get there. It's a tricky channel getting in. Um, we went aground. First time I'd ever gone aground in my boat. The last time, but the first time. And um, 
waited till it's only a one foot tide in there. Fortunately, it's a falling tide, half tide. So it fell another six inches, came back up at midnight. It lifted me off. I basically kedged my way out of there, dragged it back, the boat back to where I knew I'd been a hundred feet farther behind it. Got in the dinghy the next morning at daybreak and sounded the channel. The channel is about 10 foot wide for a lot of the way up in there. The branches are touching your spreaders as you go up to the narrowest part. It's like you just wiggle your way up in. Um, you get up in there and then it opens up to this amazing 20 foot deep, you know, just this incredible hurricane. It's just, and there is only um, one small boat that's like a 12 footer tied off along the bank. Um, and somebody left it there and then someone came up later towing a, a, um, a section of a dock and another like 20 foot boat came up in there and I helped them all tie off because they didn't want them to smash me. And I just made like a, you know, I just like, and I just used my stern anchor and tied it to the trees behind me. And I put my main anchor out in about four foot of water way out in front and dropped it and, you know, and back down. And then I just motored away from the trees all night long towards my main anchor. And it was never an issue. So it was great. Yes. Say that again, please. Right. So question, how did I, how many, and how did, how many support team did I have and how did I pick them? Anybody who is willing um, and preferably with some experience, but some people had no experience, but they're willing to basically be a relay of, of information. And so, because I only had a Garmin in reach, um, I did have a cell phone, but when I wasn't always in cell phone coverage, there's no VH coverage up in Northern Labrador, none. Um, so communication was all by satellite text, which worked great. Um, and I will say one other thing is that the Coast Guard, um, Bennett figured this out when we were in Goose Bay. He said, why don't we get in touch with, we're about to be like no weather service, right? And said, so, well, let's, let's contact the Coast Guard. And I think, but I never found out. And if I'd known, if I'd figured out who it was, I should have sent them like a bottle of whiskey, a dozen red roses, and like a, a couple pounds of the best chocolate in the world. Because we had a fifth crew member on the way up. Because what, and they definitely helped us out because we would text them. There was somebody on, on watch all day and night, right? They gave us their, they basically, they were happy to be in contact with me through Garmin, the Garmin inReach. And I would text them. I'd be like lying in my bunk, kind of like plotting out the next day's, you know, possible ports or, you know, harbors to get into and trying to figure out the weather. And I'd be, I'd be doing that every night while everybody else like went to bed. I'd be like lying there like, okay, now where are we going? Have the book out and stuff. And I would, I could text them and say, uh, you know, dear sirs, could I get a weather update? And they would know where I was to the yard. And they would say, um, uh, we'll get back to you in 15 minutes, skipper. And they, they were always super polite, super warm. It's amazing how friendly they can be with like being so professional. And usually within 10 to 20 minutes, unless something was going on or something like that, I and mean, sometimes they'd need a little bit more time, they'd get me back to me with a custom weather report for my location and where I was headed for the next 24 hours. They totally saved our neck because the weather changes a lot up there. It's very unstable, much faster weather system the farther north it seems like you go. The lows just come ripping through more. So um, they were, it really felt like I had a whole nother person on board. And so they were more effective than any of my land base down here because they gave me better reports. I did also use my brother who's a good sailor and a couple of their friends who are good sailors and other family or friends who would just be willing to kind of reach out or Google something online if I needed to. But um, there was probably, I had about a half a dozen or so people that were like, we'll help out and uh, just run through all of them if I needed to in order to get help. I also made sure that Ming's parents were kept well up to date every day from Ming about how he was doing. And being 12 years old, he wasn't always that talkative, you know, which is understandable. I probably wasn't either with my parents then, but I'd made sure they at least knew healthy, safe, having a good time, well-fed, you know, lots of adventures. So no polar bear ate him yet. So. so there's the boat where I left it in Bedeck. And. Oh yeah, so it was right around the corner. So we will come around. And you know, and as a sailor, you know that a boat on the hard is when you really see what a boat's like. Right? Not when it's in the water, because you don't see the hull. Um, back up. And uh, it was here for two and a half years. Did not like that. 
Um, and there's a great, there's two marinas, there's a marina, and then there's two boatyards in Bedeck. And so this was the inland boatyard. Peter Patterson is the owner. He was super generous. He let me work on the boat there. I couldn't get up to it because of COVID for two years. There it is. So, uh, I went up, that was, that's after the snow had already melted. I was working on it for a couple of months in the spring of 20, uh, 2022, just climbing in over the snow banks and stuff. It was cold, but I had a wood stove so that helped. And I had to do a lot of repairs from it having sat. And also from, I ran it hard and I didn't, you know, the, all that salt water all over the engine for all those, you know, for that month and a half, two months, did not do the electronics or the engine any good. So I had to work on my hands. So this is after cleaning it up and getting it fixed up and about ready to go out on the 2022 trip. And I'll just... Yep. Okay. So this is the crew. Let's see if how fast it jumps along. That's what the boat looks like down below when it's clean. Yeah, through. Oh, we missed one, but that's all right. Um, this is having crossed the Strait, the uh, Cabot Strait, and we did a 257 mile crossing. Like basically, we didn't stop until the weather changed, and this was coming in at midnight into the Bay of Islands on the west coast. And it's just a beautiful full moon. And I know you're not supposed to go make a night landfall on an anchorage you've never seen before, but I, I did, and um, we just were very careful. It was a really tight dog leg, but it worked out. It was fun. Um, this is uh, a little more of Bay of Islands. I'll try to you know, put that in roll through these. And just this is a pretty part of the coast. Um, we had then uh, we sailed through the night. Um, a next uh, one of the next jumps, and then just it and uh, Ming and I just didn't wake up anybody else, and we just like wanted to kind of enjoy the night to ourselves, and like it never got fully dark, and then. I blew my raw water pump. And this is me having no engine trying to get into a port and realizing we can't beat against the tide and the wind in a narrow passage. And so the crew said, drink a cup of coffee and figure it out. And so we dropped the anchor just out and a storm was coming. And so we figured out, we threw the dinghy overboard. It by then had an inflatable with an outboard and we just tied it on the hip and we got back up in there and rebuilt that for the next eight days. This was the, um, I was a little tired. Um, and that was uh, Porta Chucks. Uh, I think that uh, they're, uh, the French names are butchered. In um, so uh, so the way I was told to pronounce it by some people was Porta Chucks. So, um, and it's a very strong fishing village, and they had a machine shop, and which was great. And they were extremely friendly and helpful. There's a Coast Guard station right there. Um, and this is flash please. This is a, a friend of uh, we made friends with some from from Norway that were heading back. And they had a drone, so they took a picture of the boat there on the end of that wharf. Um, uh, I would say that Newfoundland uh, has you know I was expecting to have maybe flippers. Um, so uh, lots of provisioning is very available in Newfoundland, not like Labrador. So this was uh, just before dawn, sailing through the night, another time into Straits of Belle Isle. Um, I love sailing through the night. Um, this is a little later, just a few minutes later. And then this next one's a few minutes later. That is 30 white-beaked dolphins, at just as the sun was breaking the horizon, surrounded the boat and played with us for an hour. Uh, when I think about why I'm willing to do anything in my power to like stop the devastation of this planet through the climate change and all of the other horrific things we've done, I think about those white beaked dolphins. Not just my grandchildren, but like they just remind me of what is beautiful and precious and important in this world. And why should we fight with everything we got to make sure it continues? You know, like it was such, we were all just, I was hooting and hollering when they first came to the boat and then we were just silent in just awe as they, as they greeted us. And um, Ming was reaching down and his fingers were just inches from the, as they would come up from deep down below, roll up on their side, you can see the eye, look at you and then 
go away again. If you've had been around dolphins, there is so much. And these these white beaks are not that common. So they're pretty awesome. Um, part of the crew and third, 20 different people were on the boat. Um, this is another crew change here. On the uh, and kind of tiny fishing village. We did see a little bit of ice, uh, but not much on this trip. Yes, I was at the very northern tip up in Straits of Belle Isle and around the corner into St. Anthony and a little ways down that northern peninsula. Really beautiful. I really love the northern peninsula. There's a little fishing village. Apparently, it's one of the earliest cod fishing villages uh, um, years and, you know, hundreds of years ago. Um, it's been abandoned or been discontinued. Like none of the, it, the government's not maintaining the war for any of the infrastructure anymore to it. So everybody's had to leave. The government buys that offers when a village is bought out, they basically say 90% of the villagers have to agree to it. We'll pay you a fair market value for your house and you will never own it again. You can stay there until you die. You can pass it on, but you cannot repair it. Or the minor thing. You can't add on to it. Catching some cod. And we went into a town, one incredible harbor, uh, Fleur de, uh, I think this was Fleur de Lis. And this is actually where over the last, I think 7,000 years in two different periods, the, um, the native people of that area were carving out soapstone um, cooking vessels. Uh, and it's in, they have a really cool um, museum right there that is native run. And this is like right in someone's backyard. And this is like really, really awesome. Really awesome showing that. Excuse me. That that was them. That was actually like the, those pock marks are this big on that, and they carved them out with rock, chiseled out, and made then these kind of rectangular, um, rounded kind of rectangular cooking vessels. They're like incredible amount of work. But they they found found them thousands of miles from there from that you know it was like a major quarry for making those. This was the next crew. I knew none of these people before this trip. I put it out on the internet. I didn't have enough crew to do this trip, and so um, my partner she said, "Why don't you just put? It? You have a huge internet following. Why don't you just put it out there and see what happens?" And I had like it was shared like a hundred times. I had like fifty people said they wanted to do it. Thirty seven came to a hybrid Zoom and. Um, uh, in-person meeting out of that around 25 people wanted to do it we figured out schedules enough and 20 people managed to be on the boat so and so often it'd be an entire crew team three people would come on people would get off and it'd be i'd have to teach them all again some people knew how to sail some didn't this is a great crew great crew you know that all it, all the crews were great so you know terry jenny yeah just awesome, awesome folks so the there's all the seabirds there. There's also whales that you don't see right there. They're all coming in for this. Capelin. You're kind of like, this is what all the cod are eating. Everything. They are, they're like, they're like smelt, only they're sea run and they lay their eggs in the, in the sand. Like they're coming up here to lay their eggs and, uh, and fertilize them and then head back out with the next wave. It's all lots and lots of humpback whales. Like, uh, Tons of humpback whales. Didn't get very many good pictures of them. None of them breaching. Didn't see any of them. At one point, we had like four of them way off in the distance. Were <clears throat> did a synchronized flipper, kind of wham, just thunderous loud slap. They're about a half mile away, and then they did it again, just side by side, just all their flipper up in the you know side. Wham, huge waves. They're having fun. They're eating good. Um, that's the biggest cod we caught. Very cool. That was a big cod. Uh, I there's not so the cod fishery is open. I think it was Saturday, Sunday, Monday. You could catch three cod per person on a boat, fifteen maximum in a day. Well, I just had an ice chest, so like that was like we gorged on them. Um, and um, one of the traditional dishes that's really really good is called a scoff. Uh, like a nice, you know, typical, you know, stasel, reef main, having fun. Um, this is the next one is Fogo Island. This is the only time I turned down fish on either of those trips because we just had caught enough cod. We were going to be eating up for the next two days. This guy offered us some cod. He just jigged. And I was like, I just can't take it. I just don't, you know, I wouldn't be able to eat it before they went by. Um, 
So a scoff is you take potatoes and onions, and if you have carrots and cabbage, put that in there too, I think. You cook it up till it's almost done in a pot, and then you take your cod fillets. They ain't fillets, they're fillets. You, cod, you take your cod fillets and you lay them on top, put the lid on it, steam them, and that is a scoff. And you just scoff it down. And if you wanted to gild the lily, I'd put cream on it too. This is just a nice sweet anchorage right at sunset. This is kind of up on the north shore. This is coming into Lewisport. If I leave my, if I go to Baffin, I might leave my boat in Lewisport. It's a great shipyard, um, marina. And um, it's just, it, it, this reminds me of like Penobscot Bay and then some. Like way fewer boats, more islands, more kind of like, it's more beautiful. Plus there's whales and cod, <laughs> which hard to beat. Um, next crew, John, Ben, Joshua, and my friend Philip. We had a lot of rain. Uh, this is some of the birds. See you next. Um, <laughs> yep, that one. There's jigging for cod. We've never jigged for cod. The big friggin' hook on a heavy hook, you know, heavy like lead weight goes all the way to the bottom, lift it two feet up off the bottom, and then you yank it hard like that. And you hit it go down, yank it hard. We're doing that mostly in 90 foot of water or so. And if they don't bite it, you'll stab them with it. You can still haul them off. So just, it's just beautiful up there, just among the islands and stuff. I felt like that was almost like a Maxwell Parish kind of painting. And I was just like, oh, you know, all these thunderstorms rolling by. I also um, really like the seabirds were amazing. They're unfortunately, so there's the Northern Gannet, of course. Um, you know, they have like a six foot wingspan. Unfortunately, the, um, there was a lot of dying of birds from the, there's a Northern Myrrh or um, yeah, Myrrh. Um, we saw lots of razor bills, saw lots and lots of puffins. They're heading out of the harbor from visiting up, up on that shore. Um, uh, had to rub a show. I, what I didn't, every single person when they came on the boat, they had to do the Gumby drill. So this is the next crew. So there's my partner, Sarah, there's her niece. Um, and uh, so Frankie and then uh, Gib and Annie, who I knew from, uh, from 40 years ago and hadn't seen them for 30 years and they joined me. That was really fun. Um, and that was in, that was in, um, we'd made it all the way down to uh, St. John's. We headed out from there and we got down and you know how I had the, my, uh, my water pump failed on the West coast. Well, it turns out it actually destroyed my head gasket, which utterly failed right here. As we're going past these bird islands, 5 million nesting pairs of birds just outside of Bay Bulls or Bull Bay. Um, most, it was like looking at like, you seen like, uh, like a stack of beehives in a field during late August when the goldenrod is in full run in late in a, in a hot summer afternoon. Like the bees are just like <laughs> thousands of bees coming in and out all the time. That's what those islands were like. There was thousands of birds in the air, mostly puffins, but also razorbills, myrrh, and I think it's the largest uh, nesting ground. I think of maybe um, storm petrels, a, a number of pelagic birds. Just friggin' amazing. Um, so noisy, it was really, really beautiful. Um, and so then we had to go back. I managed to get back to the, uh, to into Bay Bulls. Was there eight days, They people went out of their way helping me, got it all rebuilt. That was a very happy moment. It was a long time to get the part. Um, good thing I was you're just, you're just south of St. John's, the biggest, you know, city. There, while we were waiting, we did a bunch of like exploring like sea caves and um, Frankie checking them out. Uh, collecting, we were collecting urchins and then eating them. So I'm not sure if anybody else ate them other than me. There's a lot of waterfalls in the river right there. Um, so just how do you stay busy for eight days while the, while the captain's trying to fix the engine, right? Another really beautiful waterfall. Just swimming in. So there's Sarah and Frankie. And uh, that's from uh, Mirshing Island, um, which is 
right near there. And that is looking also from it. Um, it's like one of those abandoned villages that people come back to. People come back to be buried there. It says it's very active community that still um, is, you know, considers that home. They, it was home for hundreds of years for those families and it's still like really important. Now we get into like the Southern coast. And if I go back North again, I wanna spend at least a month on the Southern coast with the fjords there. Cause you have to get halfway up Labrador before you see fjords as cool as the Southern coast of Newfoundland. Um, that's Morgan, Morgan's Bay, I think. Um, five otters came to visit us one morning. Next picture, that is Goblin Head. Those sea caves, big sea caves, right there. <clears throat> That's maybe a 500 foot high waterfall. Waterfall is like everywhere. Um, uh, if you go up to these fjords, similar to there's a nice little anchorage. That might have been Morgan. Um, uh, so you can see my boat's way up out there. This is like about a 700 foot high slide falls down in there. I used to do a lot of whitewater kayaking. That would have been death. Um, I think, but wouldn't have survived it. Um, this is going into my favorite, my favorite anchorage of all uh, that trip was actually up into this one, which is Devil's Bay. And that is, um, uh, is it, mm, forgetting the name of that. I should remember the name of that that mountain and that cliff, but that's a couple thousand feet high. It's people go to climb it just for that. There's also an eagle's nest part way up it that uh pretty cool. This is looking up into one of those glacial valleys at the head of Devil's Bay. And this I had the best trout fishing of my life for about two hours in there. I was actually like giggling and uh it was so incredible. And um uh I kissed every single trout I caught. And then I ate them because they were so tasty. But they were, <laughs> uh, no, I was using actually a, a black and yellow MEPS small spinner to be quite, quite honest. I'm, I can't claim to be a good fly fisherman at all. Wouldn't be able to do it if you tried, but love to learn someday. But I grew up in Southern Pennsylvania, so spinners was what I was used to. So, and um, they're just so beautiful. And every time it was like when you, sometimes you're in a zone fishing, like doesn't happen very often where like, you'd be like that foam pile. I know there's a fish right there. And then it goes right where you want it to and bang, there's a fish on the line. It was one of those magical days that only happens a few times in your life. That was good. It was good. So um, then this is kind of like looking at the fjords. This is kind of coming out of some of the fjords. These are like big sea caves you'll see in the next slide. Um, like, you know, my boat would have fit in that one. The mast would have hit, but they were big. Um, and then we did this crossing of, I worked my way up, but I was trying to make it across the Strait to Bell, of the Strait, um, Cabot Strait. And I did a jump from Ramia Island. Instead of going all the way to Puerto Basque and shortening a jump, I thought I had the right weather window. And so I tried to jump and do about a, almost a, like 100 and, I don't know, maybe 160 mile, 180 mile crossing. And the weather was supposed to be kind of rough for the first eight hours. And there's a strong current through there and heavy shipping, but it's supposed to swing all the way up to the north. So I'd have it on my starboard quarter and it's supposed to be 15 knots. And that didn't happen. And it's the fourth roughest crossing of my life. Um, and so that is after that. We were beat. We were taking water in the chain pipe. I never had flooded my, you know, this, it was above the cockpit sole. I mean, the, the sole of the sole and down below because so much water was coming in through the chain pipes, though they're closed. Shorted out all my wiring, the, my connections. So I lost all lights on the mast in a shipping lane, you know. And then to make matters worse, my Garmin inReach was going to go dead. And I was like, I'd lost my, my tiller pilot had failed. I was hand steering through all of it. Um, uh, Jinwa and Abby were the crew on that part. And um, neither one of them is a super experienced sailor. And so really I had to be on the tiller. And I was just hoping I was going to stay strong enough through the night to be able to do it. They were about nine foot plus. They were just over three meter seas, really close together beating into them. I had triple reef main only up, motor going full full blast, and we were getting crashed. Like I had blue water coming all the way. The cockpit was full most of the time. 
Um, and uh, it was something. I actually had a really good time, but my bilge pumps failed, my manual bilge pump failed, my my you know, electric bilge, it, it was so rough that like the little bits of uh, like, basically just the bilge pumps didn't work. So we were, and I couldn't hand pump it. So in the end, middle of the night, Jinwa was, took my, the stick pump for the dinghy and was pumping it out into buckets, dumping it into the sink drain. And we managed to like gain on it. So we knew we weren't gonna go down. I didn't think we were gonna go down, but you know, if we had to a scared person in a bucket, right? So I was ready for that, but that was rough. Yeah, the question is, the, 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 the question is, what did I do for insurance? And it's like, nothing, nothing. I don't have insurance. Uh, I have a really big anchor with a lot of chain. And um, and I and I just figure, you know, that's what I got. Our next crew uh, change in, um, in Bedeck. And so, uh, so we had, and actually, I don't have a picture of also Jim, but this is um, I can not even heat of it. So Dave and I can blank on his name is great. They're both great sailors. They did a really good job. It'll come to me. Um, so this is a sunrise crossing the Gulf of Maine. We kind of worked our way down as fast as we could down the Nova Scotia coast. I don't have pictures of it. Came into into Halifax. Uh, got. Jim to join us there because I needed someone with more experience. I wanted another person more experienced crossing the Gulf. We were dodging hurricanes. Hurricane had just gone through just above us. We went there was a hurricane coming up. So I was just like pedal to the metal. If you've crossed um, the Gulf of Maine, if you've done around that the southern Nova Scotia, the currents are really strong coming out of the Bay of Fundy there, and you have to time it well. Caught the tide just by luck. Perfect. I mean, I was watching it, but we caught we were able to catch a tide as we worked the, like two and a half days of sailing straight down, caught the tide, rounded a tip. I only had a little bit of time where current was going against wind, where it got lumpy and rough for maybe two hours. And then we just banged across the Gulf of Maine. So we basically left from Halifax and made it to Belfast in one jump. That's coming into Belfast. So we're kind of maneuvering. And you can see how big that bowsprit is. I think it sticks way out there. And uh, Jesse Yankee is the, just the working sail plan. And then just because you don't know a boat until you see the hull, right? One more shot. That's where I left it behind my son's shop. And I had to do a lot of work on her again, but she's in the water, changed a bunch of things around. And yeah. Um, and yeah, I love that boat. I've had her for 16 years, and um, I just trust that boat 100%. The Lyle Hess design BCC 28. And that is sitting on the ang on my mooring in the Belfast Harbor. So uh, thank you very much. Any questions? You already had a good turn of them, but yes, sir. The um the what is it? The CC the uh uh North is it North American Cruising Guide? Oh uh, no, the what is it? American uh, American Cruising Club, is that it? Ah, now I'm forgetting the acronym. It's the, it's the only really cruising guide you get up there. I should have brought them down. They're very good. The other thing I use when I did was use Navionics. The question is like what cruising guides to use. The Navionics um, uh, on my palm, you know, was very, very helpful between that. And um, the other thing was if you go far north, Garmin does not, uh, does not have charts for Northern Labrador. They and when they bought out um, um, Navionics, they discon Navionics had them, and they discontinued them. Um, which I assume is just for insurance purposes. I don't know why. So the charts are very bad. I mean, you take them as a suggestion when you're up in northern Labrador. Um, uh, both the paper charts and electronic charts are suggestions, and there is big areas that just say uncharted rocks and ledges for like miles. And with a single line of sounding going down through there, you know, and so um, you get so that you get pretty comfortable just using a, you know, a good, you know, seamanship. Keeping, I always kept two people on watch because you're among ice, you're in fog, and you're in very poorly charted. As you go into the harbors, lots of times on the computer, on the chart plotter, it'd be kind of like computer generated beautiful arcs that would show you're going from 300 foot deep to zero. And you'd be what was supposed to be 30 feet deep, and it may be six feet deep, or it may be 300. 
they made no bearing. And so you really had to go, but the guidebooks were quite accurate, quite helpful. Not all the harbors are covered in them. I also had people that who would cruise up there, give me suggestions and would mark on the paper charts where they suggested I go of where there'd be safe harbors. So like talking to other people that have sailed up in those waters can give you some more bailout points. Um, uh, it makes it more of an adventure, um, but it, it actually works out pretty good. If you use good common sense and you keep good watch, uh, it turns out not to be that difficult. You just got to really stay alert, so. Newfoundland is pretty well charted. I'm not, you know, it, it's Northern Labrador, Northern Labrador where it gets sketchy. Yeah. Right, question was um, on navigation, did I use anything other than GPS? And I really just use GPS chart plotter, I had redundancy systems um, and, and, off and if the and if the GPS didn't match with what I saw, I went with what I saw, and I used radar. I'd never use radar. I'd had radar. I upgraded my radar. I never really use it in the coast of Maine. I use it all the time, and I was also and I was also watching a depth sounder like a hawk, and just you know, I just using good basic navigation skills, but applying them all the time, especially in Labrador. I know I went long. Um, Oh. So, so normally we give people a ball cap. I thought this would be more appropriate. Very much so. I appreciate it. There we go. This is a this this is my kind of hat. <laughs> uh, Baffin Island is my next goal. If I can pull that off, I'd be thrilled. Um, that would be the question was where next, and I think Baffin is is the logical next uh, next challenge. Um, you have to go to the top of. Uh, Newfoundland, and then usually people jump from either the tip of Newfoundland or southern Labrador across to Greenland. I think that's the most challenging, clearly the most obvious challenging crossing. There, you never know when you're going to get it, but there's pack ice pretty much all summer up in the Labrador Sea, and in, in between Greenland and Lab, and not Labrador, between Greenland and Baffin. So when if you if you can cross or not from Greenland over to Baffin is unclear. You have to just look at the ice reports. You go up, so you work your way up the west coast of Greenland jump across to the northern top and somewhere across into Baffin and work your way down. And the fjords in the central part of Baffin on the east coast of Baffin are, um, if, if Labrador was cool, they are the next notch up. So instead of 3,000 foot high walls, it's 5,000 foot high walls. And um, it just seems like not many people manage to have a chance to get there. And I always come back so restored. I would like to share that with as many people as possible. I wish I had a bigger boat because I'd love to take six people so that more, because you're going to do a lot of effort of getting there. It'd be really fun to have more people have a chance to experience that kind of wilderness and beauty because it is so rare on this world. Thank you all very much for your attention. Oh, I probably will put it on the eye.